Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to worship on this Christ the King Sunday. We're here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We are thrilled to have all of you here to worship too. I wouldn't have been shocked if there'd only been just a handful, so um, it warms my heart to see all of you here. Let's begin with a call to worship, and if you want to stand, we'll stand. If you're more comfortable seated, that's okay too. Come. God is seeking to gather us together. The scattered, weak, and injured are drawn to God. Come to worship and give thanks. Make a joyful noise to the creator of all. Our first hymn this morning is Come Thou Almighty King. Let's sing together. Would you please join me in our opening prayer? Heavenly Father, gather us into your fold so we may be healed and transformed. Guide us in your world so we may be part of ministries of healing and hope. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Today's scripture comes from Revelation the first chapter. This is a revelation from Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the events that soon must take place. He sent an angel to present this revelation to his servant John, who faithful, faithfully reported everything he saw. This is his report of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. God blesses the one who reads the words of this prophecy to the church, and he blesses all who listen to its message and obey what it says, for the time is near. This letter is from John to the seven churches in the province of Asia. Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, from the sevenfold spirit before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. He is the faithful witness to these things, 
the first to rise from the dead, and the ruler of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord God. I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come, the Almighty One. This is the word of God for the people of God. We're going to keep that king theme going, and we're going to sing, Oh, Worship the King. Let's sing together. Some time ago, there was a leader of a men's group, and he was talking about <clears throat> how weird people are in elevators. You know what I mean? Like, when you get in the elevator, people are just weird. They all stare at the, you know, what floor they're on. Nobody says a word. They don't look left to right. They just stare ahead. It's as quiet as a tomb, and if somebody even, you know, makes the slightest rustle, all the eyes turn to them. 30 floors later, you realize that not a single word's been spoken on the entire journey, and again, everybody's looking right at those numbers as they go. Heaven help anybody who, you know, kind of bucks this cultural norm. Well, the truth is, not everybody does conform to everything that 
um, happens in society. Tony Campalo, I've talked about him several times. He teaches sociology, or he did, he's retired now, but he would teach sociology um, at Eastern University, but he was also a minister of the gospel. Um, a really great preacher, in my opinion. So um, Tony got on the elevator one time, and you know everybody was staring, and it just was driving him crazy. So he turned around, he faced everybody in the elevator, and of course everybody you know, went like that, and he led them in a chorus of, you are my sunshine. I'd say Tony's probably braver than most of us here. So anyway, this leader of this men's group was telling his listeners that because everybody is so silent in an elevator, this is the perfect time to tell people about Jesus. You know, you kind of got a captive audience. Till they get to their floor, they're stuck with you. And so he said that would be a great opportunity to fulfill the Great Commission and evangelize people. People will remain silent in an elevator, he said, staring at the floor number. So challenging the men to use their imagination, he said, what do you suppose Jesus would uh, say to people if he was in an elevator with them? And almost immediately, there was a guy in the back of the room who said, Jesus might say, going up? Oh, you got it, good. <laughs> so often. In a few weeks, we are going to celebrate the end of the year 2020. I expected roars of applause at that point. Most of the folks I see on Facebook don't think it can come soon enough. For those of us who follow the Christian calendar, though, uh, this is the last Sunday of the year, the church year. The first Sunday in Advent, which, ready or not, is next Sunday, um, is the first Sunday in the new church year. So today is the last Sunday of the church year, and it is always celebrated as Christ the King Sunday. Because of the presence of Thanksgiving on our calendars, as well as Christmas carols already playing in stores, we probably don't really give this final Sunday of the year the, the attention it deserves. But it really is an important day. We are going to celebrate Thanksgiving on Tuesday, and, you know, if you're brave, we're going to be here. Um, I don't know what's going to happen after Tuesday, but at least for Tuesday, we'll be here. So don't worry, I'm not giving up on Thanksgiving. But I think we also should take just a little bit of time out of our calendars and celebrate the fact that Jesus is our king. See, the thing is, is when Jesus is your king, it changes everything and your life. Your whole perspective is different. All of your priorities are different, and it changes everything. I want to draw your attention to two lessons from the scriptures. Now, one I'm going to talk about and one I'm not. Uh, the first is found in the Gospel of John, and this one we always read on Good Friday. And Pilate's quizzing Jesus, and so Pilate says to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answers him, you say I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world. The other passage is from the book of Revelation. John is writing to the churches in Asia, and he says, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Today, on this Christ the King Sunday, we are going to celebrate everything that Jesus means to us and to all of his followers around the globe. Okay, that sounds good. So what does Jesus mean to us? Well, I think first of all, and it seems important as you know, the world goes through all of this stuff called COVID, Jesus is someone who understands us. Why? Because he's walked our path, he's walked in our shoes. There was an article in the news, it's been several years ago now, about a publishing company that had a newcomer come in and. Um, was working and, you know, nobody seemed to know who she was, but 
she quickly fit in, and the folks at the publishing company really tried to help her out to fit in. Um, the reason nobody recognized her is she was working undercover. She was researching a part in an upcoming movie. The movie was Bridget Jones, and the actress who was doing this research was, um, and playing the part of a secretary, was Renee Zellweger. So for two months, this Hollywood actress would um, carry out all of the humble tasks as a secretary in this publishing company. She would send out books for review, she would file newspaper cuttings, she would make the coffee. Um, she was kind of a gopher in the office. Whatever they needed her to do, that's what she did. The people in the office were oblivious to who this person really was, and so they would try to help her out. This was taking place in London, and so they would, you know, try to help her. Well, here are the places, the best places to go to eat in London. Um, here's how, if you're trying to get ahead in the publishing business, this is how you do it. And they would really try to help her out. Well, they were stunned when after two months, they discovered that um, this was um, a Golden Globe winning actress they had been working with. One member of the staff said, you know, I really did wonder why the girl kept a picture of Jim Carrey on her desk. Zellweger was dating Jim Carrey at the time. It's not really unusual for um, an actor to submerge him or self, himself or herself in a role like that. They often do that. Anyone who's a professional really wants to get it right. Joseph Mallard Turner is an English painter. You may not have heard of him, but he's actually kind of famous in England. He invited Charles Kingsley to his studio and he wanted to show him some pictures he had painted of storms at sea. Kingsley looked at his paintings and he was just amazed. He said, it's wonderful. It's so realistic. How did you get something so realistic? And the artist says, well, I went to the coast of Holland and I paid a fisherman to take me out to the sea the next time a storm came along. Um, entering the boat as the storm was brewing, I told him to tie me to the mast. Think about that. Then he steered his boat right into the eye of the storm. He said, the storm raged with such fury that at times I longed to be in the bottom of the boat where, where the waves would be blowing um, over me, not on me. I could not, however, because I was bound to the mast. Not only did I see the storm in its raging fury, I could feel it. It blew right into me, as it were, until I became a part of it. After that terrible ordeal, I returned to my studio and began to paint. It's not unusual for an artist to go to great lengths to gain the perspective of something or someone he or she is portraying. But it is the unique contention of Christians that the Lord of all of the universe emptied himself out. Think of leaving heaven and all that heaven is so that he could come down to earth and walk where we walk to experience all the things we experience. When we take our concerns to Jesus, we know that he understands us because he has walked where we walk. He's been through what we've been through. He's experienced the pain of rejection and disappointment and grief and all the other emotions that can make being a human rather difficult. That's one thing Jesus is to us. Jesus is someone who deeply understands us. He's also, and I think this is the part that we kind of like to forget about, he's also someone who set a standard for us. What would Jesus do? Now, that was a very popular question some time ago, but I still hear people asking that question when they're in a situation. So what would Jesus do in this situation? Still a good question. How can we make this a better world? We can make it a better world by showing it Jesus. Let his love and mercy and forgiveness stand against all of the cruelty and hatred and violence in this world. Sometimes I think we make Jesus just a little too soft and a little too laid back. We try to emphasize grace. That's a good thing. But I think sometimes when we emphasize grace too far, 
we ignore the demands that he made on his followers. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven, he said on one occasion. He wasn't talking about the theological hair splitting that the Pharisees would often uh, do. But he was saying that there are certain things that he expects from everyone who chooses to be his follower. Think back to the very best teachers you ever had or the very best coaches you ever had when you were a kid. Didn't they have high standards and expect you to meet them? They wanted you to rise to those standards and they would push you and encourage you to do that. In this day and time when Christians act like everybody else in the world, maybe we've gone just a little bit too far to make the gospel acceptable to everyone. A faith that's purchased too cheaply might have very little hold on our loyalties. Now, don't misunderstand. We are saved by grace. We are not saved by works. But Jesus has placed his people on the earth to be salt, to be leaven, to be a light that has been set on the hill. People should be able to look at us and tell we're his. They shouldn't have to wonder, is that person a Christian or not? John wrote in Revelation, to him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priest serving his God and Father. That says to us that we are Jesus' representatives in this world. We are to reflect his love. We're to reflect his acceptance. So what does Jesus mean, mean to us? Well, first of all, Jesus understands us. And secondly, Jesus has set a standard for us. But I think even more important than those two is Jesus is our savior. Before John calls us a kingdom and priest serving his God and Father, he wrote, who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. We are those same people whom Jesus has loved so much that he gave his life on our behalf. We've heard of Louis Pasteur. Pasteur. I've talked about him, but I'm sure you've heard about him um, in school and other places. He's the man who revolutionized uh, medicine with what was once called germ theory. Um, Pasteurized milk comes from his name. We're probably not quite as familiar with his co-worker in these experiments, a guy named Dr. Felix Rue. Um, he was a Jewish doctor who uh, was also in Paris with uh, Pasteur and worked with him. Dr. Rue's granddaughter died of what was called black diphtheria. And because he was heartbroken and, you know, not too shockingly, he decided that he was going to find the cause of black diphtheria if it was the last thing he did. And he was sure it was because of germs. He just had to prove it. He didn't want germ theory to be a theory anymore. So he locks himself in a laboratory for several days with this fierce determination to, pr to prove with Louis Pasteur that indeed diphtheria came from germs. Now the Medical Association had disapproved of Pasteur. They thought this whole germ idea was nuts. And so um, they had succeeded in having him exiled from Paris. But Pasteur didn't go very far. He went into the, to the forest right outside of Paris and he and Rue were there in the forest, kind of hiding in plain sight, if you will, and they built a laboratory so that they could continue their forbidden research. 20 beautiful horses were led out into the forest of this improvised laboratory they had built. Scientists, doctors, and nurses came to watch this experiment. Rue opened a steel vault, and he took out this large pail that was filled with black diphtheria germs. Um, he'd cultured it for months. Um, there were enough germs in that pail to kill everybody in France. The scientists then went to every beautiful horse, swabbed its, you know, mouth, its nose, and you know, all the stuff they tell us that, you know, spreads COVID, its eyes, its throat, with these deadly germs. And then they waited to see what would happen. Soon the horses had this terrible fever, and quickly, one by one, they started to die, but there was one who was still hanging on. 
Most of the doctors and the scientists were wearied of watching these beautiful horses die, so they had kind of wandered off and given up. They just didn't want to see this last horse die. The orderly on duty, uh, Rue and Pasteur had decided to, you know, get some rest on one of the cots in the stables, um, had been instructed to awaken the scientists if there was any change in the temperature of this remaining animal. About 2 a.m., the temperature of the last surviving horse had gone down a half of a degree. So he went and he, he got the scientists up. By morning, the temperature of the horse had dropped two degrees. And by night, the fever was completely gone and the horse was able to stand up and to eat and to drink. Then Dr. Rue drew blood from the veins of that animal that had developed the, the disease but had survived it. The scientists then uh, drove as quickly as possible to the municipal hospital in Paris. They forced their way past the superintendent and guards who were posted there and entered a ward where there were 300 babies who had black diphtheria and had been separated so that they wouldn't spread the disease to other little babies. There they inoculated every single one of the babies. All but three of those babies lived and recovered completely. They were saved by the one who had overcome. That story came to mind this week with all the news of vaccines um, that we had. Now, certainly this is a really crude analogy, but scripture tells us in a way that is totally beyond, I think, all human comprehension, that we have been saved by the blood of Jesus, the one who overcame death. Our sins by that blood have been completely and totally swept away. We've been cured of our sins. And so, on this last day of the Christian year, I think it's appropriate that we take some time and bow at the throne of Jesus, who has won us by his love. He has walked where we walk. He has set a high standard of love for us to live up to. And by his blood, he has taken away our sins. He really is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And we worship him, not just on this last day of the church year, but every day because he is the King of Kings. Amen. And we generally stand for an affirmation of faith. We're not supposed to stand, so I think we're going to remain seated. But I think we should affirm our belief that Jesus is the King. So let's affirm that together. We believe in God, our creator and protector. We believe in the Jesus of the Gospels whose life was given to others, whose kingdom consisted of uneducated, hardworking people. Jesus taught his band of followers to care for those labeled unattractive by society. We struggle to be faithful, remembering Jesus' promise, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. We reaffirm our commitment to this type of king whose kingdom gains new life each time we love the unlovable and serve others. We believe in the Holy Spirit sent by Jesus to encourage us as we draw closer to the kingdom. Amen. Well, on this day, one of the things that we want to take some time to do is celebrate Bill Vansickle, who has a birthday this week. So, let's sing happy birthday to Bill. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. He seems taken by surprise. Any joys or concerns to share today? We have quite a few people who are out um, in quarantine, some who've been exposed, others who are having medical procedures and have been told to quarantine so that they don't get near anybody. So um, quite a few people to pray for. Yes, Susan.
Okay. Um, Christian's fiance's um, mom, Teresa, has um, COVID, and her grandma, Darlene, is in the hospital with COVID. Um, Hannah, who um, she mentioned a couple weeks ago, um, thought had stomach cancer. The good news is she doesn't have stomach cancer. The records were confused. We're not sure if the person who does have stomach cancer knows it. Um, she seems to have some gallbladder issues, so may want to pray about those. And then Hannah's sister, Jade, um, who takes care of COVID patients in Colum Columbus, right, um, has COVID herself. And so we need to pray for her. Um, I've, I've seen several things that talk about how the people who've been taking care of COVID patients are starting to get weary. And when you get really, really tired, your immunity goes down. So we need to probably, we want to pray for, for Jade, but we also want to pray for all of the healthcare workers who are taking care of um, people right now. Yes, one. Okay, that's bad news for us, but good news for you. Becky, Becky and Wayne, I can't talk, um, are headed to Florida. So pray for safe travels. Yes, Jenny. Okay. Okay, we need to keep praying for Mr. Nicely. Uh, we, we were praying for him when he fell off the roof. He's in Dodd Hall trying to teach him how to walk again. So it's a pretty big deal. Yeah, Joy. Jimmy, okay. We need to pray for Jimmy, who's a friend of um, Luther's, um, Joyce's son-in-law. Um, he is college age, if I understood that right. And um, he's had lots of health issues, and he's looking at possibly losing a foot or a leg. And he has COVID, and his mom has COVID. That's a whole pile of things um, to make one pretty miserable and even scared. Anybody else? Yeah, Jenny. Sarah, who um, has fallen down steps and um, has a virus, not COVID, but has, has had a virus. Yeah, fine. That's fine. Okay. Okay. We've been praying for Creed Bailey, who... Um, 
uh, works in the Trump administration, but is from Thornville, Ohio. And um, he's lost part of, uh, he's lost a toe and part of his leg, but he is recovering now. Um, and there was, there was some time there, they weren't sure he was going to make it. So that's a joy. Probably need to keep praying for him because it sounds like he has a long recovery, but that's a joy. Anybody else? Any joy about Thanksgiving coming? It may not look the same. That's, that's sad. But for all of the people who are having Thanksgiving, it's a real joy. Let's pray. Amazing God, you have allowed us the privilege all during this year to walk the pathways of hope with Jesus. From your incarnation in Jesus at the Nativity to his acceptance of the ministries to which you called him, from the magnificent lessons about caring and compassion as he walked the roads leading to Jerusalem, from the encounters with hostile people to the cries of those in need and to his crucifixion and resurrection, we have been blessed to learn from our Savior and have our lives transformed by his redeeming love. Bring the joy of this day into our hearts. Flood our lives with your words of hope so our ministries may glow with delight at serving you by serving others. Bless this church as we grow and continue to learn what you would have us to do. Cause us to be a haven of peace and hope in this world that is bound so often in anger and fear. We ask, Lord, that you would remember each of the prayers that have been lifted up, not just those, Lord, that have been said out loud, but also those, Lord, that have only been murmured in our hearts. We ask these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who is the King and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our closing hymn for this morning is Rejoice, the Lord is King. Let's stand and sing together, joyfully.
Go on your way, traveling by God's way. Your trust in Jesus as king is making you whole. Share the gospel through your ministry of thanksgiving. Sustain fellow saints with prayer and encouragement. Amen.